Hello, and welcome to The Hump with Katie Thoreau. I'm your host, Katie Thoreau, and I'm bringing you interviews with some incredible artists, finding out why are they so amazing, how did it all happen, and what can we learn from their journey. Before we get started today, I'd like to thank our sponsors. And first up, we have Colsteins. Colsteins is my most favorite string shop to visit in the entire world. They're based in Long Island, New York, and anytime I'm in New York City, I make a special trip out to Colsteins to see what new things they've got going on. They do instrument repair, they build instruments, they make beautiful double basses, they make their own strings and rosin, you name it, they do it. And they're incredibly knowledgeable and kind there. And they're offering our listeners a 10% discount. Go to Colstein.com and use the promo code KD10 and you'll get 10% off your entire online purchase. Or give them a call and you'll get the discount as well. That's Colstein.com. Up next, I'd like to thank Jams World. You all know how much I love Jams World. I'm wearing a Jams World right now. It's a clothing company that's family owned and operated in Honolulu, Hawaii since 1964. I love it because the fabric keeps me cool and comfortable because it's made from 100% spun crushed rayon. And the patterns are so unique because it's real art screen printed right onto the fabric. Go to jamsworld.com and use the promo code jazz15 and you'll get 15% off your entire online purchase. That's jamsworld.com. I'd also like to remind you that I'm bringing you brand new episodes of The Hump every Wednesday, every hump day. Subscribe and download on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and go follow us on Instagram at The Hump with Katie. You don't want to miss a beat of what's going on over here. All right, the time has come to bring you our guest this week. I am so excited. They're not a bass player, but they have played with the best bass players in the entire world. So we're, we're making an exception on The Hump this week. Of course, I'm talking about the clarinetist and tenor saxophonist, Ken Poplowski. There's so much I could say about Ken. Of course, all good. I've had the privilege of playing with Ken for the last five years or so, and it's just been incredible. So I invited him on The Hump to talk about his story. He was in Benny Goodman's last big band, and he has played all over the world, and he is such a mentor to younger musicians. He has such an interesting career, and he's hilarious, by the way. So without further ado, here's Ken Poplowski. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm so excited to talk to you, Ken. I love talking to people that I know really well because then I find out things that I had no idea. Um, but and you've you've played with so many amazing bass players too. I mean, Milt Hinton being one of them. So I'd love to talk about that. But um, I'd like to start from your humble beginnings. You're such a an eclectic person from your musical stylings to the music that you love and all the different things that you've been involved with musically. So. Take us back to the beginning, Ken. Hmm. Well, I was I was born, uh, believe it or not, as a small baby. Uh, some would say I haven't changed, but uh, large baby now. <laughs> but I grew up actually. I grew up. I'm fortunate. I think I grew up in the. I was born in 1959, so I grew up when the Beatles came along. 1964, they came to America. And I still remember going with my parents and my brother to see A Hard Day's Night in the movie theater mm. at five years old, you know, and, and the girls were screaming in the theater. Uh, and it just the, the electricity of seeing them and hearing them, first of all, hooked me on the Beatles for life and, ma and made me think even then, like, somehow I want to do this, you know, in some yeah. form or other, you know. And then uh, it was also a good time because... Um, like as messed up as my home life was in many ways, my parents were anything but conservative musically. Mm. Uh, so we all, and I think this was typical maybe of that generation. Like we all listened to everything together. Mm -hmm. The Beatles, Duke Ellington, you know, Benny Goodman, uh, polka music, soundtracks, uh, comedy records, you know. And, yeah. and, and so I was exposed to a lot of different kinds of music and, I the only reason I played clarinet was because my dad was an amateur musician and he tried and failed various instruments and mm -hmm. my brother got the trumpet and I got the clarinet and I fell in love with the instrument and also we my brother and I had a Polish polka band called the Harmony Kings Aww. and we were working that's a good polka band name yeah. right we were working um, since I was about eleven years old I guess eleven or twelve playing weddings and dances, things like that. And, and it made me learn 
how to improvise, first of all, because that music uh, utilizes uh, improvisational clarinet for a lot of it. Mm -hmm. While there's two trumpets playing in tandem and, and the songs are so similar to early uh, New Orleans jazz. Every mm. song's got three or four parts. There's yeah. key changes. There's even drum breaks sometimes at the end. Uh, so I learned to improvise kind of in that arpeggiated style. Yeah. Uh, and learned in a backwards way, which I'm glad I did. In other words, I, I learned to improvise first just by trying stuff. And it, it probably all came from Honey Pie. It probably all came from... Um, that's my little dog, Honey Pie. She'll be she'll be interfering with us. Until we see her, we're just going to think you're a little nuts. But, well, you know, <laughs> uh, James Stewart had the rabbit, and I've got uh, my invisible dog. Yeah. Uh, she's now not going to come up. I know this. Yeah. So We've offended but, uh, her. Yeah, that's right. But, uh, you know, so I learned how to improvise by trying it. I sat at the piano and figured out chords by just writing them down and I, w I would mm. hear, oh, okay, this is this, this is this. And I would write arrangements for the band. My earliest arrangements were just notes stacked up on top of each other. Mm. And then later, I w again, I went backwards. Later, I found out the theory behind it and said, oh, this is why, you know, a C chord goes to an F chord, you know, a yeah. G7 goes to a C. Uh, and I'm glad I did it that way because uh, I learned something that I still teach students, you know, the value of throwing everything out that you know or think you know and just trying stuff and playing by ear and, mm -hmm. and using intuition uh, sometimes. And that's a good way to develop your own style, you know? Yeah, sometimes uh, the theory so really gets in the way and um, causes people to maybe think like, like improvising is like a mystery almost, like you have to decode all these theoretical things instead of just like, just go for it. Yeah. Yeah. It gets so overwhelming, too. You, you know, there's not hundreds, but th probably thousands of books on, you know, how to improvise. Yeah. And I think of, you know, a poor student coming in that way. And, you know, really, do you have to use that scale for that chord? You know, know. the answer is no. <laughs> you know. But James Moody, you know, I knew James Moody a bit, the great saxophonist and flautist. And he was a lifetime student. He, he bought every method book that came along mm -hmm. books of patterns he'd send them to people i got some from him and his thing was you know you could take what works for you yeah. you know but stay open and try to check out you know everybody's approach mm -hmm. yeah that's a good way of looking at it too because i know some people are like um completely against transcribing because they're like oh i only want to sound like myself well oh. that's only going to get you so far right yeah um yes. you know i don't mean to interrupt but you're absolutely right. And, and in fact, the people that say that, if they didn't transcribe, they certainly listen to records and that's going to influence their playing anyway. Yeah. You know, you're not coming from a vacuum, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. This is, this is great. So you're playing clarinet and I know you, you went to a little bit of college, right? Yeah. Uh, but like, two years. But like through like high school, were you kind of gigging more on on the polka scene or were you were you were you into jazz at that point well yeah by that point by the time i hit high school i was very much into jazz in fact i had two great teachers one in junior high and one in high school that you know this is garfield heights very small town but there was still a big what we used to call stage band scene you yeah. know and so and it was very competitive and i had two teachers that were so into jazz and they could see some kernel of something in me and let me arrange things for the big band. Mm. The high school, the junior high school band director had me write all the music for um, one of those year end pageants, you know, mm -hmm. like a talent composition for orchestra. I had no idea how to do that, yeah. you know, but I bought an orchestration book, figured out the ranges of the instruments, you know, and it's one of those things where if you're not told you can't do it, you go ahead and do it, you yeah. know? Yeah. So I was lucky. So so I started playing more and more jazz, sitting in with people, having we'd have jam sessions in our basement. We'd invite musicians over. In fact, the trombonist John Fetchak, mm -hmm. uh, who's very much on the scene uh, in New York, um, he used to come over and jam with us. <laughs> That's awesome. Another Cleveland guy. But so, yeah, my ambition was to, to move out of that and try to do my own thing. Uh, and because my chosen instruments were clarinet and saxophone, I knew I wasn't going to 
playing the next Beatles, you know, yeah. but uh, yeah. And I, you know how it goes. I started buying records and reading liner notes and you, you'd hear, okay, Benny Goodman was influenced by so-and-so, you know, then mm-hmm. you'd buy a record by that person. Uh, and it, and it just ballooned from there. You know, I took the money that I made playing those weddings and dances and bought lots of records and worked really hard on music. Yeah. And it's like, no one had to tell you to do that homework you know, like the research upon the research of who listened to who, who, and all that, you just kind of, and I know you're really interested in things like liner notes and how things were produced. So it wasn't something that anyone told you to do, right? Right. Oh, exactly. Although my father, he was one of those like strict disciplinarians. He'd sit there, he'd sit while we were practicing and critique us. Uh, but my reaction to him was, you know, screw you. I'll, I'll try to get so good. You know, you can never say anything, you know? Yeah. And so I developed like an external kind of a shell about that. Cause I also had a tough clarinet te- teacher in high school. And then I went to college Cleveland state to keep studying with him. Cause he was, he, he pretty much, you know, he gave me a speech in the first lesson. He goes, look, I know you can play, you know, but you're you're taking a lot of shortcuts, and mm. he, he kind of broke me down, and almost started me from scratch. And I learned a lot about breathing properly from him, projecting, you know, just a lot about sound production mm-hmm. and and technique too. You know, and I also studied voice for two years in college. Oh, I didn't and know learned, that. Learned a lot from that. Yeah. Uh, you know, just just projecting, pushing the air through, concentrating the airflow, and you know, you don't have to as you know, you're a, vo- you're a great vocalist. You don't have to sing loud to be heard. You know, you, it's yeah. a, all about, um, you know, concentrating the air and, and projecting your sound, which doesn't equal loudness. Yeah, there's so many similarities. Uh, I mean, it's very similar between voice and every woodwind instrument because it all ha- you know, has to do with that airflow, air stream, air support. I totally yeah. agree. Um, so... Uh, I mean, you're in college, and I know you didn't finish, uh, but what, so like what, you left college for a certain reason, right? Yeah, I, I got an offer to go on the road with uh, what we used to call ghost bands, yeah. uh, the Tommy Dorsey band, but it was led by a guy who had the band much longer than Tommy Dorsey did, <laughs> a trombonist named Buddy Morrow, who was a virtuoso mm-hmm. trombone player who was used to play in the NBC Symphony, he worked a lot of studio dates, uh, great guy. And we were out on the road 48 weeks out of the year doing mostly one-nighters on the bus. And usually, you know, that was actually, back then, it, that was the alternative to college for, for most jazz musicians. Uh, they Their dream was to go on one of the big bands yeah. and then maybe go on a, a band like I was on and then go on to Buddy's band or Woody mm-hmm. Herman's band. Um, and after two years... You know, the, the pay wasn't great, you know, but Buddy gave me a big feature spot on clarinet. Mm-hmm. He even had me tell stand-up jokes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but he, he, you know, he was really uh, a great force for me, you know, and really pushed me in front of the audience. And he gave me a speech after two years because, you know, I was playing lead alto on that band. Mm. And it's, it, it's a hard life doing those kinds of gigs. Yeah. But anytime I... Th- wanted to leave he'd give me just enough of a raise to keep me on yeah and after two years he called me into his room his hotel room and he said uh i'm gonna let you go if you promise you'll move to new york and Mm. play you know play with the big boys as he put it you know and and don't don't go back to cleveland and be a big fish in a small pond and uh, you know you and he gave me this whole talk about always trying to challenge yourself and Mm -hmm. And so he he's was really responsible for me moving to New York. That's awesome. D- did you have that feeling when you first, I don't know how, how did you get the gig with the Tommy Dorsey band? Because I know most of the time it was like, you know, some, like a friend would say like, hey, there's an opening, call call Ken or something. Yeah. So how, how did you get that gig initially? Well, uh, I, actually my quartet was playing in this Cleveland Jazz Festival. We were the Cleveland contingents contingent teddy wilson's trio was there who i also sat in with him and and the tommy darcy band and so they came down and listened while i was playing and uh called me this is kind of maybe an interesting thing um 
I, you know, I told you I had a weird and rough childhood, and it's true. And my both of my parents were very controlling, in strange ways. Uh, they wanted, they loved me playing music as long as I didn't leave the family umbrella. You know, oh, and then yeah. they were completely discouraging. So, so the road manager called uh, to offer me the job. My mom took the call and did not tell me. Yeah. And luckily, they were persistent enough to call a month later, and I picked up the phone and I said, "Yes, I'll be there." You know. I have a similar story. Uh, I got a call that Berkeley College of Music was going to give me a full ride scholarship, full room and board, and um, I wasn't home. And someone else took the message, and no one ever told me. And then uh, they, but they called back. Luckily, they called back. Yeah. Was that for a similar reason? Yeah. 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 I know. See, yeah. there. You got You have to believe in some kind of fate slash luck every one now and then you know yeah um so when you when you first won the tommy dorsey band i didn't know you were playing lead alto but <clears throat> was that an easy position to step into because i know like you're the new guy you're the lead alto yeah. like you know somewhat considered uh you know you're the section leader but also almost leader of the band in a way you've got you know lead mm. trumpet and trombone and all that yeah. but was it an easy spot to fill initially or was oh, there no. some hazing yeah there and also there was hazing in a good way but I knew I had, a, you know, I hadn't really played lead alto a lot before that, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so I had to get my act together really fast because I didn't want to get fired, you know. And but Buddy, they but and the lead trumpet player, a guy named Dennis Tribuzzi, they they helped me a lot, to, you know, telling me you gotta you gotta play out more, you have to take charge of action. Also, a funny thing that Buddy said that really struck stuck with me and i've noticed this over the year he said every lead player in a section has a little bit of an edge pitch wise on the sound not really sharp but a little bit slightly above to cut through and it's very true you mm. can hear it in orchestras the concert master is always you know this yeah. infinitesimal plays sharp lead trumpet players and again it's just more of a concept than you know, you don't hear that somebody's playing sharp. Marshall Royal yeah. sounds a little bit, you know, just enough so so you you poke above the rest of the section. Hmm. I never noticed that. Yeah. But that was the first scary situation, and there were many more after that. You know, and yeah. uh, I did learn something. Again, I I tell students this. Uh, if you know, it's like you're constantly relearning how to swim by being thrown into the water, you know? Yeah. And if, if you want to play with confidence, the only way to do it is to fake it long enough. So eventually you're not faking anymore, you know, but you have to play, play your own mind games against, against yourself to, to try to trick, trick yourself into getting up there and saying, I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm just going to play the best I can and they'll either like it or they won't. And, and, of course, you care what people think, but the more you can do that, uh, the better it is, you know. And eventually, you you can play in all kinds of settings and with people that were your heroes or, you know, you never thought you'd play with. And like I still to this day, I'll, I'll give myself a, just a little talk and say, uh, "Look, they hired me, you know, yeah. so they want me. They they like what I do. So it's just like meeting." A group of strangers you know some people will like you and some won't and it's the same musically and you can't care you shouldn't care about that stuff you yeah. have to just try to be yourself be as relaxed as you can play at a hundred percent and uh and then everything kind of takes care of itself in one way or another yeah and and i think you're such a beacon of shining light in that way because you know so many people helped you along the way gave you talks or men mentored you and i think you're definitely doing that now for because you you feel so free to say what's on your mind in a good way before yeah. or after a gig or even during a gig to help yeah. somebody. Incidentally, you're fired. Oh, OK, thanks. Or whatever we have on the books, which is probably nothing. Maybe 20, 30. Well. Yeah, that's um, right. No, but you you um you want to help people, you know, like if someone's in a slump, it's yeah. like yeah. it's just uh, you've said things before, like, you know, it's just one one day, one gig or yeah. You know, it can only get better, right? Like, yeah, if things are going really bad. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, you, look, it's like a, an ocean wave, you know, that you wouldn't have the, the wave without the bottom part, you know? Yeah. And so 
you have to remind yourself about that sometimes. And and you're right. You know, I wouldn't be where I am had I not had a lot of help from from these great mentors. Milt Hitton was one, and Bucky Pizzarelli, Dick Hyman, and, and uh, you know, it goes on and on. Uh, and Hank Jones was really nice to me. And hmm. uh, but you know, it's so you try to pass it along because it is. I look upon our our uh, the group of musicians as one crazy family. You mm-hmm. know. It's, and sometimes we feud with each other, you know, sometimes, but, but we, you know, everybody tends to pitch in for each other. Yeah. And, but there's definitely, we've all been around musicians who will say nothing, which makes it even worse when you're having a bad day Yeah. or, or you're kind of like, man, does this, like you were kind of saying, like, does this person even like playing with me? Like, why'd they call me? Like, you mm. feel like you're getting iced out. So you just, yeah. you just don't take it personally and you just play your best. That's it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and I am kind of upfront about this stuff, too, because I, you know, I, first of all, I, lo- I like working with um, slightly younger musicians like yourself and, and uh, Matt Wittick and uh, Justin Coughlin and uh, uh, Glenn Zaleski. And, there's, you know, there's a, there's a whole list of, of uh, musicians I like. Aaron Johnson's a great reed player. And, but I, I like the energy and I like people. I don't want anybody coasting, you know, yeah. when I play ever, you know, it, it, and I want people that we can make music together, talk freely about mm-hmm. it. And, and also that I get along with that's, yeah. that's really important. Cause I don't want to, I'm too, too far in this business to do any handholding or worry about somebody's personality or offending them. Yeah. So I, it's nice to find people where you can just cut through all that. And I make kind of make that clear from the beginning. If I like somebody's playing, uh, they're in, you know, yeah. and, 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 but that means, you know, we talk about stuff and we, you know, we try to improve the music all the time. And, you know, I think sometimes people, cause I choose to play a more, for lack of a better description, straight ahead jazz, you know, yeah. standards based jazz. Um, but not even that sometimes, cause I like interpreting, I just like interpreting things that appeal to me and mm-hmm. trying to find my own way into it. But, uh, th- that's why the, the younger people I like because they they're more open again musically. They're not jazz snobs, mm-hmm. you know. So if we want to play, um, you know, a John Lennon song or so or anything, you yeah. know, we can go in that direction. Uh, Burt Bacharach, you know, what, whatever comes up. Um, and but I think sometimes people think straight ahead jazz is just going ching ching ka ching, yeah. you know, and walking and four and. But as you know, because we've worked together a lot, I like it very open. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't like being horn player with rhythm section accompanist. Yeah. You know, I ne- never liked that. Uh, so I want people that give back and, and I can play off of, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel the same way as a rhythm section player because it's no fun when someone's just, you know, barreling and playing over you. Yeah. And then the worst offense for me uh, is is watching quartets through to quintets or or sextets and and it's always the same order of soloists yeah. you know all the players first then piano then bass then maybe you'll trade with the drummer yeah you know? and i get i get bored listening to that mm-hmm. one after so so we try to mix things up in the set too and the order of solos or maybe we'll do a collective improvisation and yeah you know it's it's about my own uh uh not not being very tolerant of, uh, of, of boredom, I guess. You yeah, know? no, I get it. Um, yeah. so speaking of boredom, I'm bored now. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I'm only joking. Um, so you left, uh, on a, on a great note, uh, the Tommy Dorsey band and you really, you did go to New York. I did. Yeah. And only knew, uh, one person actually, a guy who I'm still in touch with Mark Lopeman, a mm. great saxophonist and arranger. And he's to this day, he's written a great, book for me for pops orchestras and uh big bands but yeah i had and i had enough money saved up for to last six months on the in new york with the rent i was paying oh i'd also done eight months on the road with annie before that annie the musical the musical because oh. they, they still had touring musicals that you where you would do even a whole week in a town oh, with, yeah. with a real band you know yeah. so i Cause that paid decent money and I was trying to save up some money. So again, I was prepared for six months and then I didn't know what was going to happen. 
And Mark Lopez actually called me to sub for him in a rehearsal band that was led by a guy named Lauren Schoenberg, who uh, had a great big band at the time with Mel Lewis mm -hmm. in it, Danny Bank, Dick Katz, uh, a lot of veterans combined with younger musicians. Mm -hmm. So it, this is how it works in New York. And uh, to some degree, L.A. too, I know uh, you do one gig and you, it's a big band gig. So now you've met, you know, 14, 15 yeah. musicians. They call you for something else, you know, and, and it goes on and on from there. And you keep running into all these circles of musicians. Some intersect, some don't. Mm -hmm. And, and you, it, your world keeps expanding, you know. Yeah. Um, so where where'd you go? I mean, because we're getting to I, I feel like you've been on the road since the 70s yeah. or the early 80s. Early. Yeah. Yeah, I guess early 80s. Yeah, I have. I mean, that's a lot of my work is on the road as a jazz soloist. That's 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 it. You know, uh, a lot with local rhythm sections, too. And mm -hmm. uh, learned a lot that way, you know, playing with some bad, some good. And, and again, like we talked about, you still have to try to keep keep up to what your own what you consider your your level best, you know, yeah. uh, no matter what else is happening around you, you know, you you have to, um, you know, you have to bow furiously while the uh, Titanic, yeah. Rings, you yes. know, yeah, yeah, you have to brace yourself. Yeah. Oh gosh, um, been there. So, um, and you're tour you toured all over Europe, and I mean, pretty famously, you were in Benny Goodman's last iteration of of his band. Yeah. So how did that come to be? Um, actually, again, it, through Lauren's band, because Benny wanted to get off. Benny wanted to uh, put a band back together again. And he, he'd been retired not for very long. I think a guy like him couldn't stay retired. Yeah. But he wanted a real big band, not a one-off thing that he could rehearse every week and then do gigs and records. And so he, he auditioned Lauren's band as, as a band. Oh, I didn't know uh, that sadly fired Lauren from his own band effectively uh, and everybody else. Me and Jack Stuckey, the reed player, were the only two who lasted from the beginning to the end of that band. Wow. It was about a year, year long, right up until when he died. Mm -hmm. uh, and we rehearsed uh, every week at the Wellington Hotel in New York. Um, and uh, he was a tough band leader. But again, I kept telling myself like, uh, you all, all I, I just have to play the best I can play yeah. and try to stay relaxed because I don't want to get fired from this. You yeah. Know? Uh, what, uh, what? I mean, you were playing clarinet in the band or saxophone? tenor, tenor sax and some clarinet doubles, you know. Yeah. But I'd given him, uh, like very naively, I'd given him a, a cassette tape that I'd been shopping around to to record companies. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get a record deal, and. All he said at the time was, he goes, you know, oh, I listened to the tape. It sounded nice, you know, and I thought, all right, yeah, you know, next, you know. Yeah. But after he died, the uh, president of his of the record company we were signed to uh, came up to me at a club and said that Benny wanted to produce a record of mine and uh, and said, you should sign this guy. And hmm. but uh, but they passed, you know, and then I signed with Concord. But yeah. Uh, but that really touched me, you know, to, to know that he actually cared that much. Yeah, because I, I mean, I've heard from you and from other people in reading like uh, compliments were not plenty coming from him. Yeah. But what was um, I mean, working with him and seeing him lead a band and, and play, what was like one of the greatest lessons you learned working with him? Yeah, well, one one uh, one thing that was very important to him um, I'll I'll go back a bit and explain a rehearsal. We we could do a four hour rehearsal and, and not even make it through one arrangement because mm. he'd keep stopping and starting. And he would rehearse. I think he kind of came up with this technique by himself. He would rehearse just the winds mm -hmm. with no rhythm section, no foot tapping, nothing. Yeah. And you know we're playing a lot of those old Fletcher Henderson arrangements, which are all these call and response things. And so the saxophones might be going ba da 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 da, -da and then the brass, you know, ba da da ba, ba da da, mm -hmm. ba, you know, and it has to lock in like the pieces of a puzzle. And if it's not locked in, you either get better or you're out of the band, you yeah. know, right away. But his thing was, I learned this is everybody has to have their own strong internal sense of time. 
mm-hmm. and not lean on, on anyone else. And if everybody has that, uh, then when you bring everything back together again, there's a whole lift to the sound of the group. Mm-hmm. Um, and boy, he had a great sense of time, that's for sure. I mean, he could really, when he, he could start playing just quarter notes and you could f- feel the lift, you know, it was yeah. this, this sense of forward motion in his playing too. Yeah. So that was an important lesson I learned. Did you guys ever do any recording? I, I know there was a TV special. Yeah, there was a TV special, uh, but we did, we did some record. We did a whole studio record that some of it's come out in compilations, but the whole thing has yet to be released, mm-hmm. and it's probably tied up in, you know, different. It's been sold, sold and resold to different yeah. companies, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. Um, and I know, like at the same time, you you were like the young guy. Almost seemed to me like from what we've talked about all the time playing, you know, like at Dick Gibson's party, or or you'd be in Europe as the younger person, or you're on Concord playing with with older people. Um, so what was that like? Were you taken in by the older musicians as well? Yeah, definitely. Uh, they would. You know, the, all those. I was fortunate enough to meet a lot of the the last of the great players from not even swing era, but I guess swing era and the bebop era that were around. You know, uh, but people like Mel Tinton, Gus Johnson, Major Holly, mm-hmm. uh, um, Zoot, Zoot Sims. Uh, you know, uh, Roy Eldridge, uh, Sweet Edison was so nice to me. But they would they would all haze you a little bit. They would give yeah. you grief. But they they did it because they liked you. Yeah. In fact, I, I I'm sure I've done that with you and oh yeah yeah Matt and everybody else you know. But, uh, but it's so it's such a different thing now that I almost have to tell everybody first. You know, I'm 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 gonna if this I is like a joke. You, yeah. Yeah yeah. You should worry when I don't make jokes. Yeah. You know? But uh, no, they were very supportive and and recommended me to to players and uh, but there were a group of us that came up in New York. Around the same time, you know, I'd say Scott Hamilton, Warren Vachet, a little bit older than me, but maybe just before me. And then there was me and Dan Barrett, Howard Alden, Mm -hmm. uh, and then a a little after me, Harry Allen. But we were all choosing to play kind of song based jazz. Yeah. And I think in some ways in, in America, at least, you know, in Europe, we were very accepted. But in New York, a lot of the critics uh, trashed us. Cause I think we were too early, yeah. you know, now it's very acceptable to play that stuff. But I remember one critic, uh, I don't want to mention Gary Giddens, name, <laughs> but, uh, he, he referred to us as young fogies, you know, mm. he, he'd went for this. he just wasn't listening. You know, yeah. he wasn't paying attention. You know, n- nobody there was trying to recreate anything. We were just playing music that we loved and, yeah. and kind of play it our own way, you know? Yeah. And it was a time, you know, like whatever you, call fusion jazz happening and you yeah know, what you were doing to other people was you know the exact opposite or maybe like the easy way you know someone saw mm. like oh they just can't play yeah fusion right yeah uh, oh dear and i can't yeah so, they're, they're right yeah um well if it's okay with you i'd love to talk about some of the bass players you've played with like we mentioned because like like you just said, the musicians you played with, like Sweets Edison and Zoot Sims, yeah. your your timeline, the overlap is so interesting. Like you said, mm. like you had people who were playing in the 40s up until mm. the day they died, right? So yeah. the overlap is really fascinating. So, I mean, you know, Milt Hinton, yeah. Major Holly. I, don't Ray, know, I played with Ray Brown a little too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A little bit with George de Vivier. Uh, but I'll, I could tell you about Milt. First of all, Milt was one of those musicians where I would, I would be really surprised if anybody ever said anything bad about him. He was, he was such a beautiful guy, helped everybody out. When um, I got a phone call from him at the first year I was in New York and he, he said, is this Ken Poplowski? Yeah. And he said, this is the judge, Milton, you know, I, I've been hearing about you and I think we should meet. And he had it he had a place out in Queens and he had a little studio apartment in Manhattan because he was doing so much studio work. Mm -hmm. So he called me up to his apartment and told me to bring my horns and we just played together. And that was his way of welcoming me, welcoming me into the fold. 
Mm. And he even gave, you know, when my both of my sons were born, he gave me a, like a starting coin collecting set for each one of them. He was so thoughtful and he did that with everybody, you yeah. know. Um, and he was somebody, a perfect example of somebody who never rested on his laurels, never um, took it easy. You know, I think as soon as his health started to deteriorate uh, and he felt like he couldn't dig in anymore, that's, and he could, when he couldn't play anymore, then he, that's why he died because mm -hmm. he couldn't play anymore. I really think that's true. Yeah. Uh, the, the reason, the passion, not the passion, but the reason was gone. Yeah. But, you know, every time you'd get with him on the bandstand, he'd, he'd play a hundred percent, uh, whether it was, you know, I played a wedding uh, mm -hmm. once and the band was Mel Lewis, Milt Hinton, Steve Kuhn, um, Bucky Pizzarelli, and the other saxophonist was Buddy Tate. Mm, wow. You know, we're playing somebody's wedding, you know, yeah. playing. But there's Milt, like, just, just like laying it down. And he had such a beautiful, big sound, mm -hmm. you know, such a great sense of time. And again, he'd be one of those examples of a bass player that, there was such drive to his playing. I keep using this term a lot with great musicians, but the, it, it's a real sense of forward motion in his mm -hmm. play. It just, yeah. everything kept a lift there and kept everything moving all the time. Was that uh, something that you had experienced before playing with him or was it something that kind of illuminated something in you? Cause I know that's, I love playing with you for that same reason. You have a lot of push to your playing. Well, uh, I might've experienced that with other people around that time, you know, if, uh, uh, but certainly he was a shining example, as was Bucky Pizzarelli on mm -hmm. rhythm guitar. Yeah. Bucky could, could elevate any rhythm section and play with anybody from a traditional jazz band to a more modern group. And um, I don't want to really say stay out of their way because that's not what it's about, but compliment everybody else and, and actually add something to the to the feel. But Milt, yeah, just fantastic beautiful sense of drive and that that huge sound of his too um always struck me uh i always liked bass players that even if they played through an amp they sounded like an acoustic bass player you know mm -hmm. uh, i'm not a purist about anything but uh if it sounds like an electric bass then you should be playing an electric bass you yeah. know yeah so and he had that beautiful sound yeah. just a huge sound was Milt, I, I'm confusing, was it Milt or Major Holly that you were playing a gig with and the drummer was a little... like? Oh, no, that was Major Holly. Uh, yes, we were playing a gig and the drummer was just like, ting, 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 you know, looking around, <laughs> keeping time. Yeah. And I'm not going to name his name, but, but Major Holly is yelling at him in the middle of the song and he said, he said, hey, you, and I don't want to, <laughs> hey, you MF, you know, uh, wake up he says you got 22 hours of the day to sleep for these two hours you can stay awake yeah you know it was funny and it's also so true mm -hmm. i think about this when i play with um rhythm sections that are just like passing the time literally yeah. and figuratively you know and it's like is it that hard to focus for two hours out of the day yeah you know? really you know the, you, th that's not a lot to ask of people you know so there's a lot of truth to that, you know? Yeah, and I, I remember, um, I hope he didn't tell me that story because that was happening, but um, I remember, I never I forgot that too. Oh. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. Uh, I don't know, but, but if it was, thank you, because um, I, I think about that all the time, especially if I'm someone else in the band. It's like, you know, you're on the road, you're tired, you just flew into Switzerland that morning yeah. or wherever. Everyone's yeah. tired. Everyone hasn't eaten. We're all, mm. well, we're not all cranky. I know maybe, maybe you are. Um, but uh, it's, it's time for the music. It's not, yeah. you can sleep afterwards. Right. But, and, and if you think about it, that's the whole point of, of getting there. Yeah. So if, if you're going to sabotage your own gig, you might as well stay home, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's all we have at the end of the day is the music. You know, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's really gotten me through a lot uh in my career and also in life you know that's if you can like just pour everything into that and again those two hours you're on the bandstand it's it's uh but you guys you know playing with you i 
I'm not just saying this because you've paid me to say <laughs> it and, and you wrote the script. Yeah. But uh, no, but you've, I've never experienced that with you. You always c come through, you know, I've experienced with you what you pointed out where sometimes you get bugged with your own playing, and, yeah. but we've talked about that too. And, and, you know, I'm certainly my own worst critic. Uh, I don't, you know, I told you this in the past. I don't like to listen to my own albums, yeah. and, uh, but the way I see it, you know, again, any performance, whether it's a recording or a concert or, or whatever it is, um, again, all you can do is, is relax and be yourself and, and be the best you can be on that day in history. Mm -hmm. And then that day is gone and it's time to, to, to do it all over again, you know? Yeah. So you can't, can't let that stuff get in the way of your playing. Cause it's, it slows everything down. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It does. yeah. And, and, and then you're, um, um, sacrificing the music for everyone else playing with you. Like, just because you're having a bad day doesn't mean that everyone else has to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, speaking of bass players, a guy who I used to play with a lot, who I just got an email from, because he's been living in Germany for the last maybe 10, 15 years now, Greg Cohen. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you know him, but mm -mm. fantastic bass player. Um, if you look at his... Uh, CV, you know, he's played with everybody from Tom Waits to Lou Reed, mm -hmm. you know, to Woody Allen. He was a member of that band. And yeah. He and I did a lot of gigs together in my early years in New York. And again, he was a great guy because he could, we could go in any direction. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd play a trad jazz gig and then we'd be working at the Knitting Factory playing free jazz. You know? Yeah. Uh, and literally free jazz. Yeah. If you played at the Knitting Factory. But, um, but, uh, you know, he was he was great that way. And and again, a very old school bass player with modern sensibilities. But he had, you know, dug really deep, played, mm -hmm. you know, one of those guys who played with gut strings at the time. And yeah, uh, but really, you know, all the sound came from him. Uh, yeah, that's all I want to say. Uh, so what do you uh, I want to get to some road stuff, but like just what do you listen for when you're playing with bass players as you know, in the music as you play. Yeah, well, um, I, maybe it's it's obvious, but maybe it's not. I mean, time is number one. Harmony is is number one. I want um, I want interesting bass lines that uh, that maybe aren't obvious, but also aren't jarring at the mm -hmm. same time. You know. Um, I think what I want is a bass player that can read my mind, yeah. uh, kind of, you know. Yeah. I, I want to. I want to feel like we're hooked up, just like I, I do with the drums too. Yeah. You know, I want. I want to feel the pulse. I want it to be creative, and I'll, also, I like bass players that know. For one example, when to go into two or four. Yeah. Or stay confident enough to stay in one thing too. Yeah. Um, Sometimes it drives me nuts. Well, a real pet peeve is, and you don't do this, uh, is playing a ballad and the second chorus all automatically, here we go, double time now. Yeah. You know? I like that yeah. this is turning into a critique of what I don't do. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but, so, so like someone who's just confident in what they're doing and, and listening. Yeah, the confidence thing is very, very important, yeah. Yeah, and listening and reacting. Yeah, again, because I don't want to, um, you know, an anonymous basis behind me that's just plunking away and just getting through the gig. You know, I yeah. don't want. That. I want. I want some surprises. You know, and things like that. And and also, I want them to listen to me. Like if I'm indicating, you know, we're moving now into a slightly different kind yeah. of a groove that they can pick up on that. And uh, so. Yeah, it's it's not, you know, I guess I want the same thing from every instrument in the rhythm section uh, in, in some slightly different ways. But it's it's always about listening and reacting in the moment and also having the, a really, really solid sense of time, mm -hmm. you know, and also this is an interesting thing. You, uh, a bass player and a drummer don't necessarily have to be putting the beat in the same place. Yeah. Like, there, for example, there's a there's a record that I love. Uh, it's the Phineas Newborn record with Ray yeah. Brown and Elvin Jones. Mm -hmm. 
Now, if you really add each one of them, the downbeats are in slightly different places. You know, one is way ahead of the beat, one is behind the beat, but they're all so confident uh, and so steady that nobody budges and it creates a different kind of groove that's yeah. really great, you know. But the worst is um, I can sometimes hear on the bandstand people losing their confidence. Yeah. And they the bass players will start going with a drummer who's way on top of the beat and then the tempos mm -hmm. rise or, or the other way. Yeah. Uh, and and everybody's trying to feel each other out. Uh, and we save that for after hours. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. No, but um, sorry. Uh, but uh, um, no, but everybody's just trying to, to uh, OK, wh where does he want this? Where does he want to see that's there's no time for that on the bandstand. You yeah. know, we have to, you have to pl play the way you play and, yeah. and we'll try to bring it all together. You know, yeah, now, no, sometimes I... there's unstoppable things like you you might play with a, a drummer that you can't budge this person or if they're dragging, yeah. uh, there's nothing you can do. And you're just going to like come out with a backache at the end of the night yeah. at, or an arm ache from trying to keep it moving forward, which you still have to do. Yeah. But at some point you just have to th throw in the white flag and, and say, you know, I, this, this person's not going to change. They're not listening. Yeah, you exactly. Know? Yeah. Yeah. And I still try to, have a good night by playing the best I can, uh, but I will just make a mental note. Well, that's not a person I want to use anymore. Yeah. But also sometimes it's, it's, as you know, it's a chemistry thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To, to a bassist and drummer might hook up really well and they sound great. And then another bassist might hook up with the same drummer and a, a great bass player. And there's just nothing there. Mm -hmm. It's some weird, mysterious yeah. thing that you can't really, uh, can't analyze. It's just it's a chemistry thing. Yeah, uh, one of my favorite things that you do on when you're performing, when we play together, or, or when I'm watching you, is that I love at the end of the night or to begin off a show, um, to begin a show, you'll push yourself to play something like extremely fast, yeah. you just to prove it to yourself. Like at the yeah. end of like you know two nights or, or a week or something like. I, I can I can achieve this at any time I want, and I love that you push everyone else to do that. Well, thank you, uh, but yeah, it's it's really as much pushing myself as it is everybody else too. Yeah, yeah, I, I you know, one of my musical heroes and guys, a guy I've played with so much of these, Dick Hyman, at the age of I think ninety four now, he still sounds can sound like Art Tatum at the piano, mm -hmm. you because know, he's practices every day. He he just lives for the music. Uh, and that's certainly my goal. I want to, I want to, uh, I want to play piano like our Tatum. Yeah. No, but I, you know, I, I don't want to be the one I used to play with older musicians where they would do the following. If you call a fast tempo, they'd say, what is this circus music? You know, yeah. why do you want to play those fast tempos like that? Uh, meanwhile, if you went back 20 years, you could hear them playing those on recordings, you yeah. know? So just, don't give me that excuse. Just say, oh, I, I'm sorry. It's a little, can we play something slower? Yeah. But I just want to, I don't want to ever feel like I can't do that, you know? Yeah. And then you can, I mean, hopefully everyone's firing on, on all cylinders, but you never be the want to be the one in the group that isn't making it. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And the only thing, I'm sure you agree on this, uh, if you're playing an ultra fast tempo, the worst thing you can do is get nervous about it and tighten up. So mm -hmm. that's, that's another di um, uh, kind of a discipline thing you learn by doing is, you know, breathe, yeah. relax, you know, uh, you, you know, I, I always talk about this too in lessons with students is uh, you economy of movement, yes. which applies yeah. to any instrument. It just makes sense. If you want to play fast, uh, you want to stay out of your own way mm -hmm. and you want, for example, the fingers to move the least amount possible. You know, if you look at uh, the footage of Charlie Parker playing the only footage with sound, which Dick Hyman is on incidentally, mm -hmm. uh, he looks like the perfect classical saxophonist because yeah. his fingers are just, he's just pivoting, mm -hmm. you know, just like this. There's not a lot of this, you know, yeah. great bass players. It's the same thing. Drummers and the, every, there's always somebody that breaks that rule, but, you know, you usually it's wrist action or it's, you know, it's about breathing and relaxing and then coming around whatever your instrument is. Yeah. Uh, 
because it because if you're flying up from strings or or you're, you're yeah. flying from keys it takes you that if it, even if it's microseconds it takes you that much longer to get back yeah and i i know some bass players um or students i have or we we'll, we'll talk about it like they kind of freak out because of that if you're moving too much but when you're playing something fast like i i love playing just one of those things with you because there's there's like a thousand chords in it, right? There's yes. never like each each measure is changing. Yeah. Um, so when you have something like that, are you thinking? I don't even like to think analytically, so you yeah. probably don't even have an answer to this. But um, you're not thinking measure to measure, right? Right. You might even be thinking one whole form, you know? Yeah. You know, here's my um, short answer to that: that I learn a song so I can then forget it. Mm -hmm. I learned the changes so I can not think about them, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's what you want when you learn a song, especially a burner like that. Again, you're putting a time delay on it. If you're, if you're stopping and thinking about, okay, where does it go now? Where does the bridge go? Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to learn it so well that you're not thinking about it. every once in a while though, again, the brain is, we, we all, we all put, you know, roadblocks up for ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, every once in a while, it'll happen to me on the bandstand where I'll just start thinking, go, well, where does this bridge yeah. go? And it th completely throws me. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love it. I can't wait to, to play. At, oh God. I can't wait. To, yeah. At, at a thousand. Well, I'll be ready for a thousand BPM, Ken. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. I guess one, one last topic of discussion, cause you spent so much time on the road. Um, then again, that thing comes up with, like road etiquette, road life etiquette, and you you being on tour with with big bands too. Like that's that's a whole another thing to deal with. You know, twenty other people. Yeah. But what are some things that you've kind of learned for yourself that either works, doesn't work, or helps you out? Yeah. Well, first of all, you can't hang out every night. Yeah. You know, it's just not going to work because that's that's when you're going to show up on the bandstand tired and cranky and you know uh, you got to think of the music first or else you're going to burn out very quickly mm -hmm. on the road. I don't care what age you are. It's, I learned that early on. You, you, you know, you don't go out every single night and hit the town. And, um, and I'm, as you know, I be, I'm comfortable just being by myself and, you know, I read, I read a lot. I watch things on the computer. Uh, sometimes we'll get together on the road and watch a movie or mm -hmm. just hang out and listen to music. But, um, you need some, you need some private time to just mentally clear everything and, and get ready for the music. You know, I, I take that so seriously, you know, yeah. and I also, I don't like, um, let's say going out with the promoter, uh, right before mm -hmm. the downbeat, you yeah. know, cause, cause they're just want you to amuse them. And, yeah. you know, uh, I just need a little private space, you know, to, to clear my head, you know, uh, and that's important to me that's kind of kept me relatively sane over the yeah. years and books. I'm a, I would love to read a lot and, and I knock out uh, a lot of business stuff when I'm on the road too. Mm. So then when I'm home, I can, you know, reintroduce myself to my little dog yeah. and my girlfriend and just, just kind of t have a real time off then when I'm home. Cause yeah. I've, I've not only worked hard, but I've done a lot of the business stuff, you know, emails and trying to get gigs and things like that. Yeah, um, yeah. Cause when, when, uh, you tell people like, you know, you're on a tour, you went to Paris, England, Germany, and they're like, Oh, you get to, you know, see so many things. It's like, no, that's not what I was there for. And I, I've yeah. been on tours where I won't name people, but they'll go do that stuff all day long and then yeah. they'll complain about how tired they are. And it's like, yes, yeah. go do that on your own dime. Yeah, absolutely. And, also, I think we've all learned, no matter what somebody tells you, there's no such thing as a paid vacation for us. No. You know, well, you should bring your spouse or, or partner on this cruise, or you should bring them with you, you know. Then, no matter what they say, you, you I, you know, we always feel obligated, like we've got to, like, take them around and do mm -hmm. things. And and uh, not a good idea. Yeah. You know, it, like you said, we're there to... to to work and play the gigs. And, um, if I like something I've, I've actually made mental uh, notes of places and come back and spent time yeah. on a real vacation. I did that in it, a lot of places in Italy because I, I would have played Rome, you know, once. And then maybe the next year I went 
with my girlfriend or whoever yeah. I was with and and did a real week in Rome. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that about you, too, because I'm perfectly fine being a hermit on the road. Yeah. Uh, the Eiffel Tower is not going anywhere. I, I saw yeah. it on my way from the airport. You know, yeah. it's kind of good enough for me. Yeah. Because um, I don't want I. I, again, I won't name this other person, but they were just complaining like in the morning, you know, like the morning call times. And it's oh. just, what do you, then, then leave, right? What are you doing? Yeah, I know. See, and that's again, that's why I have, and I've discussed this with many other musicians, um, John Clayton being one of them. We, we, I think he, he agrees with me. We have the no assholes policy mm -hmm. where we, it's, you know, you want to work with people that you like and you don't worry about. You know, you don't want to be yes. holding anybody's oh. hand because yeah. that one one component in a band can bring everybody down and mm -hmm. ruin the tour. Yeah. You know, we've all been there. You know, somebody starts getting dark and it, <laughs> we all do that on the road. Yeah. But if you get dark, that's maybe more of a reason to put some time aside for yourself, get through it. Yeah. You know, don't bring it on everybody else, you know. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um well, do you have like one uh, road story that is of any significance that is something funny or good or like you missed a flight, you, uh, you missed a tour? Oh, well, I did miss a, I missed a flight once in uh, England. I slept through the connection, uh, and, but nobody bothered waking me up. It was, you know, one of the things I woke up and, and there was, it was a completely empty room. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They, but, just, they just thought some homeless man was. Yeah, I do have a I have a story that's not really funny, but it's kind of an interesting. Uh, I don't know why you just thought of this, but because we're talking about times on the road. Um, you, you know, people, some of my most memorable gigs are just kind of moments that I remember. And I used to play a, in uh, Ireland and England and Scotland quite often. There was a lot of work over there. Mm -hmm. And I had one of the best gigs of my life in a, a, a small pub in Dublin called the Bailbacht. I remember that was what it was called. And the place was packed. You couldn't get any more people. And they probably squeezed 200 people into a room for it. Yeah. Uh, and, I, you know, it was just one of those nights where everything clicked. Uh, you know, I, I was maybe in my early 30s, late 20s. And I just felt like that moment, like I almost an out of body experience, like I, I was felt like I had the whole world, you know, ahead of me and anything was possible. And this is what, a, you know, and these people, this audience, I play a ballad and you'd see them crying, mm -hmm. lots of them, you know, afterwards, <laughs> and, and then yelling and screaming, and we couldn't get out of there. I, I probably played I played at least four sets, you know, wow. I like hours passed when we were supposed to, to yeah. leave and we were just drenched in sweat and there's no air conditioning. And it was just one of those great moments. That's what keeps you going, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and little pl places like that. I mean, I've played Carnegie Hall and all the famous places, but some, it's funny, uh, things that stick out are sometimes the smaller gigs where it's just one of those nights where, you know, you feel like magic happened, you know, it's just. Yeah, especially like you're saying, when you go to those places, more rural parts of Europe or like, you know, northern Sweden, where, you know, daylight only happens for like one minute a year. And then yeah. then you come and you play for them. And there's it's a different level of appreciation. Yeah. And uh, we've all had this, too. Like I've I've done gigs. I think we had this discussion. In fact, I've done gigs where I don't feel like playing at all. Mm hmm. And a lot of times that's when it really happens. Yeah. Uh, and then vice versa. You you come on and, oh, I can't wait to play. And then you feel like, oh, man, nothing's happening tonight. Oh, I do have a great funny story for you, though. So in England, a lot of times the promoters would try to save money by by not putting us up in hotels. That's incidentally for every promoter out there. Take note. That's that's a that's a non non starter for me. Yeah. I don't do that anymore, ever. I don't, I'm staying at people's houses, not to, so, you know, and they'd always say the same thing. Well, we thought you would enjoy some home cooking, you know, yeah. and, and then you go to somebody's house and they say, well, just 
pretend we're not here and make yeah. yourself. No. How can you do that? You know, so so you're entertaining them for for mm-hmm. for 10 hours and then you got to play, you know, but so and almost just as bad are some of the bed and breakfast in England because they're tiny houses. Yeah. You can hear everything. And, the, you know, in England, they have they've got an they've got an attitude about certain things like a begrudging attitude, even if they're, they're running a bed and breakfast. Yeah. And the promoter paid them to put you up and they're still like very begrudgingly giving you breakfast. Yeah. So I had this place in, in Weymouth uh, and they'd had bad luck with every other hotel every year. It was something turned out horribly wrong. So they gave, gave me this bed and breakfast. And uh, I come down and there's um, one couple sitting at the table with me. And then there's a couple that's running a bed and breakfast and there's swinging doors kitchens so the guy comes out puts puts the, you know some of the food and at that time well almost always i you know i'm lactose intolerant like mm-hmm. a lot of people so i was i poured orange juice over my cereal yeah which people do yeah. you know yeah so he um okay let me let me go big up backtrack he he walks in he puts down a, a plate of food then he says he says, they tell me you're some famous uh, jazz musician. What's your name? Oh. And I tell him my name. He goes, well, I've never heard of you. You know, have have you ever heard of him? And he asked this couple. <laughs> yeah. He goes through the doors, comes yeah. back. He says, where are you from? I said, New York. Ugh. Yeah. I, I couldn't. I could never live in a place like that. Back again. So now he brings this orange juice. I pour orange juice over the cereal. I try to do it so nobody notices. Yeah. He goes to the swing doors. I hear him tell his wife, he says, he just poured orange juice over his cereal. And she says, somehow I'm not surprised. Oh, like, yeah. You know, what did I do? I, I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's like you're on the road and you have to, you're meeting strangers all the time and you're kind of fitting into yeah. their lives. Yeah. 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 But that's, that's why we all, you know, most road musicians have, have a dark sense of humor because you, you have to very quickly develop a sense of the absurd, you know? Yeah. And things, people always come up and make either weird criticisms or, you know, I'll be on a high from playing. And I've got a great story about this. Now you got me going <laughs> playing at Ronnie Scott's. I've told this on the bandstand. You've probably heard me say this. I bet Ronnie Scott's, I played a great set. I'm feeling really good about myself. I go up to the bar and there's this elderly lady uh, talking to me. And this was about 10 years ago. So she's talking, and then in the middle of the conversation, she says, how old do you think I am? Yeah. You know, always a little. I said, oh, I have no idea. She said, I'm in my 80s. And I, you know, I was being yeah. polite. I said, oh, you look fantastic. And she said, well, I take good care of myself. I, you know, I eat the right foods. I exercise. And she said, and may I ask how old you are? And I said, I'm in my 50s. And there's a big pregnant pause. And then she says, says oh i guess those years on the road will do that to you oh yeah <laughs> you know just deflate the balloon yeah exactly yeah and i just slink back to the dressing room well on, the, on that note ken you look yeah. fantastic you really do i mean you well, take care of yourself yeah i i actually i try to eat well and uh you know not a drinker and you know my yeah. dog keeps me exercising every day and my girlfriend's vegetarian, so I've been doing, uh, I would say, 90% vegetarian food now. Yeah. So uh, I feel good, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I told you, if you go, you have to go on the bandstand and make it really dramatic yeah. like that. Sylvia Sims. Yeah. She finished the last night of a great week, sold out crowds, got a standing ovation. She stepped off the stage and died yeah. instantly. Yeah. yeah. That's, That's the way to go. Yeah. You have to do that for me. I okay. Mean, not now. Just all right. We're not set, scheduling it. Set a date. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not going to take any more of your time. For my death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's on the calendar, at least. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. And on that note. Yeah. On that note, yeah. um, thanks so much for taking the time today, Ken. Like I said, it's I know you um, pretty well for a few years, so it's it's kind of fun to get a little inside look. Um, 
at to what's going on up there. Um, But yeah, thanks so much. I loved the insight on on the bass players and just you're you're one of my favorite people. You're a magnificent musician. And I just I love the career that you have just starting from that polka band, making it to New York and Benny Goodman. And now you I you're such a mentor to myself and so many other musicians. So thank you, Ken. Oh, thank you. Well, again, I'm not just saying this. Uh, no, but you're, you inspire me to play, you know, uh, I love working with you and I can't wait till we can do that again. You yes. Know? Yeah. Hey, let's do one next time. Maybe for this, this same site where I interview you. Sure. I'd love it. You I can know. hear your, your answers to a lot of you these. You can get kind. your own damn podcast, Ken. Well, I'm doing a streaming yeah. thing now. Anyway. Yeah. Every Thursday on Facebook, folks. Oh, yeah. Let's. Uh, so every Thursday on Facebook, you stream. It's called In the Moment, and it's uh, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. And it, everything go, goes up on YouTube, too. Uh, In the Moment with myself and Glenn Zaleski. And I've set a challenge for myself. Every week I do six to eight songs that I've either never played before or played once or recorded once. And it's always a first for the two of us. Mm-hmm. And we do only first takes. That's so, great. You know, makes it gives you that kind of adrenaline rush. You well, know. speaking of how you you know you push others, you're a mentor. I mean, we did that gig in Switzerland at at uh, Marianne's where we played. We didn't repeat a song for five That's nights. Right. It was like eleven sets, and we played yeah. over a hundred songs. I think the total was 113 songs. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and actually, every piano player should take note. Justin Kaufland was on the gig, who was blind, and learned. I think I only g- gave you about two months notice on this, if that. No, I don't. Well, you know, Marianne's. Yeah. It was like. No, but I mean, I, I came up with the idea. Oh, yeah. Maybe a month ahead of time and, and sent a list of songs from this big fake book. And I said, well, I'm going to choose from like 200 songs. Mm-hmm. Justin learned all of them. The blind man, every piano player watching this and listening yeah. to this uh, by by listening to seven or eight records. And he had the songs nailed. Mm-hmm. Which just goes to show you there's no excuse for not not learning some songs, like yeah. building up a repertoire. You know, you don't always have to get the book out. You know, yeah. 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 So that was that was fun. That was yeah. A that really was a great fun. experience for me. Yeah. Yeah, and me too. I mean, it was a it was a challenge to try to remember all of those songs yeah. myself. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and that's another one where if I hadn't played a song in ten years. If I started thinking about it, it would definitely throw me. Yeah. If I thought, okay, now where does this bridge go? But yeah. if I could just go on, on almost automatic pilot and just play the song in my subconscious, you know, mm. it, it would work. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I was once, now you've got me talking. I don't want to leave. Oh, no, that's fine. That's fine. I was once on the bandstand with Milt Hinton, Dick Hyman, and I don't remember the drummer. And this is the only time I've ever experienced this with Dick. I called polka dots and moonbeams and both he and Milt Hinton forgot the bridge and, and stopped playing both wow. of them. And I, I was so happy. Yeah. Because it, of course it happens to all of us humans, you know, and I, yeah, yeah. I came up to Dick afterwards and said, boy, that you've made me so happy tonight. Yeah. yeah. I've never heard you, you know, go up on a song like that before. Yeah. And that was the last time I ever heard him do that too. Yeah. No, yeah. That's great. Yeah. I hope that happens next time we play, Ken. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, well, thank you once again, Ken. Thanks. This was so much fun for me. And um, yeah, like that. Thank you. You continue oh, to be safe. Nice. Yeah. Thanks. You too. Yeah. Say, uh, Ken really does have a dog. You just can't see her. She's sleeping now. Yeah. I lulled her to sleep with my, you know, soothing yeah. stories. It tones. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Hey, yeah. great talking to you. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll probably call each other in a couple of days anyways. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. All Thanks right. so much, Ken. Take care. You too. Right. Bye. Bye.